I just listened to a friend of mine telling me how he feels comfortable with his investing skills and his strategies after two years of studying the markets. He retired two years ago, and that's when, for the first time in his life, he started paying attention to stocks and bonds. He has stocks and bonds, and he feels really good about his portfolio. He said, and、uh, there are going to be minor sell-offs in the market. He said, but his portfolio was designed to ride this out without damage. And he was talking about his future. Clearly, the future success of his portfolio was starting to impact his decision making today about the future. How, with this additional income from his portfolio, he would do all sorts of things, and、uh, the income from his portfolio would pay without sweat for the high costs of living in San Francisco. This type of story has now become a constant theme. It goes like this: I'm really smart. And know what I'm doing, and will make money forever because over the past few years I made money, and everything I touched made money, and now I'm a genius. I remember feeling that way in 1999. Only this time, it's a lot bigger and a lot broader, and a lot more leveraged, and a lot more people are involved in it, and all doubts have evaporated. I'm Wolf Richter, the publisher of WallStreet.com, and you're listening to the Wall Street Report. It's Sunday, August fourth, two thousand nineteen. These kinds of conversations are popping up everywhere. It's just a casual conversation among geniuses. I remember feeling that way in nineteen ninety nine. The market had taught us to do the craziest things because they made the most profits. Doubts evaporated. Just about everything made money. Crazy things made more money, and the craziest things made the mostest. We knew what we were doing. We were self-anointed geniuses. We had a big pile of fucky money. That's the money that allowed you to blow off your boss and give the company you worked for the finger because、uh, you had enough wealth to where you didn't really need to work. Work was just sort of something you wanted to do, but didn't have to do because your large income from your bets in the markets would make you more money than you could ever make working. This fucky money was an escape hatch to a better place. And it was open and ready for you to wander through. And、uh, other folks had early retirement in mind, and other folks did crazy stuff. I quit my job at the end of 1995, and without actually meaning to or having planned it, ended up traveling around the world for three years, going to over 100 countries, including 25 in Africa. For three years, I was living out of a bag, and and I had a blast. It was the best thing I'd ever done. And my fuck you money allowed me to do it. When I finally came back in January 1999,、uh, the bull market was roaring, and everyone in it was a genius. And people who thought this market was crazy and who set it out were considered pitiful morons. The conversations in 1999 were eerily like the conversations now. There is the same wise acknowledgement that there would be dips, but so be it. Our portfolios and strategies are designed to get us through them without damage. There is the same notion that we have now mastered the future, and that our wealth wasn't at all staked on highly risky, overinflated, iffy instruments, and that even if something untoward happened, we could always get out in time. Then suddenly, and and I mean the signs had been everywhere for a long time, and、uh, for all to see, and so the word suddenly doesn't really apply. The the whole house of cards came tumbling down. The infamous fuck you money just evaporated. Early retirement plans were shelved. The bosses had to be put up with, and life went on. But instead of fun and the aura of genius,、uh, people grappled with the loss of everything. And there was a growing sense of humility about these iffy bits that had been taken, and these folks were steeped in pain as streams went up in smoke. The Nasdaq, where most of the fun had been had, ended up plunging 78 percent. For people with leveraged positions and margin debt, the losses could be total. The S&P 500 plunged over 50 percent, and after the S&P 500 had barely recovered. It was knocked down again by about 55 percent during the financial crisis. It took a coordinated effort by the major central banks around the world, to the tune of over 10 trillion dollars of money printing and asset buying, to bail out those investors, 
or, and that's what happened mostly, make those folks immensely rich that were not in the market when the shit hit the fan and that still had plenty of liquidity, borrowed or otherwise, to be able to jump into the market with both feet when the markets bottomed out. And now the same conversations are back that were had in 1999. The same cocksure self-confidence about mastering the future about nothing being able to go wrong because we're so smart now. And at the same time, the market is more leveraged than ever. Corporate America, that's your stocks and bonds and loan funds, is more leveraged than ever with even weak companies being able to pile on debt. Back in 1999, the exuberance was largely limited to stocks and focused in particular on what was called tech stocks, which were anything with a dot-com near its name and given that this was the first big bubble of the internet, hence the word dot-com bubble. Now the exuberance is everywhere. In the stock market, nearly across the board, in the housing market, in the huge credit market that includes bonds of all kinds and leveraged loans and collateralized loan obligations and mortgage-backed securities and subprime auto loan-backed securities and rent-backed securities and old bicycle-backed securities and other credit instruments. And of course, in the derivative market, everyone is chasing yield. Risks don't exist. We call it the everything bubble for good reason. In fact, the dot-com bubble, as huge and crazy and irrational as it was, pales against the everything bubble. So there are two guiding principles now. One, nothing can go wrong. And two, there are no risks. And if those two guiding principles fail and things do go wrong and risks suddenly exist and trample on everyone's dreams, then the third guiding principle kicks in. The Fed will always bail us out. So I invite you to look at the stock markets where central banks have tried everything in the book to inflate them and bail everyone out with strategies such as negative interest rates and massive QE. Turns out, The U.S. indices, such as the S&P 500, are the exception rather than the rule. Not because American corporations are so much better, far from it, but for other reasons that may no longer apply in the future. And we'll get to those in a moment. In the major markets, where stocks are denominated in currencies that are relatively stable against the dollar, so the euro, the yen, the Chinese renminbi, the pound sterling, and, and the Canadian dollar, we discover a universe that has been shitty long-term. Currency matters when we look at other markets because, for example, the stock market in Venezuela has shot up to astronomical highs simply because the currency those stocks are denominated in has totally collapsed due to hyperinflation. I also exclude from this uh, comparison countries like India, whose currency has lost close to 50% against the U.S. dollar over the, the time frame. So here are the biggest non-U.S. markets denominated in currencies that are relatively stable against the U.S. dollar, starting with Asia. In China, the Shanghai Composite is now back where it had first been 12 years ago, and it's down 50-some percent from its peak in October 2007. Japan's Nikkei index is back where it had first been in 1986, and is down 50% from the peak in 1989. That was 30 years ago. The index is also down from two years ago. In Germany, the DAX-K, which is comparable in its structure to the S&P 500, is back where it had first been in 1999. In the UK, stocks reached a new high in May 2018, but have since fallen off. Currently, the index is just 7% above where it had first been in December 1999, so it made 7% not per year, but over the course of two decades. The French stock index is back where it had first been in 1999, and is down 24% from its peak in 2000. Italian stocks are down 60% from their peak in 2000, and Spanish stocks are down 45% from their peak in 2008, and are below where they'd first been in 1999. The Canadian stock index, the TSX, is up about 10% from its prior peak in 2008, with a huge plunge in between, so that's less than 1% a year, 
not even keeping up with uh, inflation. The entire world has come to invest in the S&P 500 because it was the only big index that was thought to be going anywhere. And this money flow from around the world has helped inflate it. But American companies are no better than German or Japanese companies, far from it. They are, however, very good at financial engineering, which is not a beneficial long-term strategy. And the fact that the S&P 500 has continued to surge, while nearly all other markets with stable currencies have been shitty, is not proof that this outperformance will just continue in the same manner. The blind exuberance about stocks and just about all other asset classes in the U.S. tells me that there may not be a lot of eager buyers left to keep inflating every corner of the vast everything bubble. Signs of that are already everywhere. Central banks have not been able to levitate those other stock markets, despite all their efforts. This includes the efforts by the Bank of Japan whose huge QE program includes buying equities. In the end, there is no cure for a bubble other than unwinding the bubble. And this, as those other stock markets have shown, can take decades of downtrends where buy and hold is a losing strategy and where lucky market timing is the only thing that works and where unlucky market timing is profoundly destructive. I am Wolf Richter, the publisher of WolfStreet.com. Thank you for listening to the Wolf Street Report.